Oh, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Container Security 101 workshop. See a good number of you out there, a couple people still trickling in. Glad you were all able to make it. We're going to get started on time. <clears throat> and uh, kick things off, I'll do a quick intro. We're going to go through just a few slides, maybe somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Then uh, we'll, we'll kick off the workshop portion of this which will kind of be guided at your own direction. Uh, I've got some instructions hosted online. You'll run all of this in your own environment, but I've got some automation to help you if you need it. And then like Laura had mentioned in the chat for the Zoom, we're gonna do most of our discussion over in Slack. So if you hadn't, let's go back real quick, uh, joined the sansurl.com slash sans workshop, jump in there, that's where we'll be able to help you that's where we can do some kind of bantery discussion and things like that. All right, well, let's get started. My name is John Ziola. I am the CTO and co-founder of a company called CISO. We started this company a few years ago to do modern security for software companies, especially places that develop software that's hosted in the cloud and that also need things like ISO 27001, or SOC 2 or CMMC, things like that. People that want to do modern security with modern tool sets, uh, that's kind of where we specialize. I'm also a SANS instructor. So I teach the SEC 540 Cloud Security and DevSecOps automation class. I love doing that. It's really a good time. The content that we cover today is going to be similar but different from what's in that class. So if you like this workshop, you might like my class. And like I said, in the Discuss channel, I am based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where I'm physically at right now. I do a lot of local community building things. So I run the local B-sides, a uh, meetup called Steel City, InfoSec, et cetera. And I'm also really into open source. So I contribute mostly to the CNCF and the open SSF, although I'm Apache Software Foundation con committer and I've got a couple of my own projects. That's where I spend most of my time nowadays. And so just another reminder, if you are going to have questions or if you'd just like to discuss with other people doing this workshop, Slack's the way to do that. You can go to that sansurl.com slash sans hyphen workshop and you'll see just a couple of channels in there. Go ahead and jump into that help channel if you need help and we'll keep an eye on that once we get to the uh, the workshop portion of this. All right, so my goal for this kind of introductory presentation section is just to provide an on-ramp to the workshop. So the workshop is going to be very focused on container security, actually securing the containers. What I'm gonna talk about now is maybe a little bit about why and what's the scope. And we'll get a little technical details if you're here for that as well. Don't worry, we'll have a little bit of that in the presentation side and then much more of that in the workshop. So this is a hands-on workshop. We're gonna be looking at abusing containers. We're gonna do a little breakout. We're gonna do some preventative engineering, et cetera. But before we do that, I wanted to cover why we're even talking about containers with just a couple of slides. So why does this matter? Why is there so much adoption with containerization? So I don't need to read this slide to you. There's a lot of different reasons. I would say that the, the bottom line here is that a lot of newer technologies, newer frameworks, newer tools are expecting that people are developing with containers. And so if you adopt and use containers, then you and your development teams can use those more modern tool sets in a more streamlined way. And that's really because of these other benefits, we're seeing that happen. So. I think you're probably similar to me that we don't want to work on legacy, old, fragile, difficult environments or code. We want to use more modern things in order to enable that. Containers are pretty much the way to go today. Even if you're going beyond Kubernetes or systems like that, and you want to go to serverless, you can also run serverless containers. And there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you can deploy stuff that are in containers in a serverless event-driven architecture, et cetera. And the reason why containers are now reasonable is because they've been supported by 
innovation in the Linux kernel itself, automation tools and frameworks, and the fact that we have mature cloud providers now. Obviously, there's the big three, GCP, AWS, and Azure, and numerous others. And by having that ability to just hit an API endpoint, provision a server, deploy a container, et cetera, uh, you know, we're able to move a lot more quickly, provide more value to our business. And that's really the goal, right? But in order to support that additional business value, we need to make sure that things are, things are secure. And so what are containers? We talk about why containers, but what are containers? You may have seen something like this in the past. On the left, we have an illustration of containerized applications and on the right, virtual machines. And you can see there's a different number of layers and the boxes are a little bit different. The key thing that we wanna pay attention to is this layer between the application and the operating system. So on the containerization side on the left, we have applications A through F, and they are talking to an operating system. But on the right, in the traditional virtual machine world, each application runs on a separate virtual machine and has a different operating system. Now that provides us much stronger security guarantees. I don't think anyone would say that containers are as secure or more secure than virtual machines. That's definitely not the case. And in some environments, some people are actually running containers inside of virtual machines, one-to-one -one mapped to get the best of both worlds a little bit. But we've got this additional operating system in virtual machines, typically per application. And so when your application needs to open a network socket or read or write a file or do some sort of memory allocation, it is going to talk to its guest operating system. And in a virtual machine world, again, that's one-to-one -one mapped and that works. But applications, application A is not able to talk to application B's operating system, even though they're in the same environment, same hypervisor, et cetera. So that's a restriction in the virtual machine world. But that does not exist in containerization. We've got multiple applications deployed on one system, one operating system, and all of them can talk to the same exact operating system. That sounds a little scary, but there are some things protecting us. Again, not as strong as virtual machines, but we do have some controls. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Sometimes it helps start at a very high level, but we are gonna actually talk about what is a container? So a container is really a process that's running on your computer with constraints. It's just a normal process that's been locked down a little bit. Things like C groups, capabilities, namespaces. You can even use some LSMs, App Armor, SE Linux, whatever. All of these different technologies to restrict maybe what it can see, what files it can retrieve, how it can interact or make network connections to other applications. You can constrain that stuff. <clears throat> you could even make it think that it's in its own little environment, even if it isn't. And so that's where this pivot root or root jails comes in. Continuing down the rabbit hole, just for two more quick slides. If you wanted to make a container, you typically go for Docker. That's the most popular commercial tool out there, free for individual use, paid for commercial use at certain levels. But if you wanna do a very simple lightweight container, you actually don't need any of that. You can do that with tools right out of the box on popular operating systems. And so here's a, an example of me actually doing that. This is, to be clear, very, very lightweight and not nearly as robust as Docker as far as the management, operations, security, et cetera. But you can see conceptually what we're doing here. You may just download the Alpine file system, this mini root FS file, just a couple files, into a directory and let's open it up. It's gonna have a root directory, a var directory, all kinds of different things. There are files that Alpine expects to be there. These are things like libraries and shells, uh, things like that. 
Then you can run very specific commands that interact with the Linux kernel. You can see that big long command right here. And at the end, you could see we have jumped into this slash hash environment and we are actually in everything below this hyphenated line is actually a very, very simple, very lightweight container. But we've made it so that we're running a shell in an environment that only currently knows about the things that were downloaded before. It doesn't know about anything else on my host. It has a restricted uh, variety of namespaces, so it can't see more. It can't see other applications and things like that. Again, this is not this is purely for demonstration purposes. But it's interesting to see how with just a few commands, you can actually make a very lightweight container. And with a few more, you can start to restrict the, that container in that process. But if you were to jump back up out of this container, out of the shell at the bottom and say, what does the processes look like on my system? It's gonna look like this. And so that bottom bolded line, that's, that's the container. There's nothing really special, right? If you know this output, the standard PSEF, you can see that it's just been ash. There's no special thing running. It's not inside of another process. It is just bin ash running on your computer. It's just whatever you said to run, running on your computer. And it has those constraints around it. And so you can see how from like a host to container operating system, these are really just processes. When you're running a container, you're just running a process with these constraints. And so it's a lot kind of weaker than a virtual machine. If you run a VM per system, you're not gonna be able to run PSEF and see potentially other containers running on one host. Those are gonna be completely separate. And now where do these containers run? I took a couple of diagrams from a white paper in the CNCF. The CNCF is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And inside of that bigger group that holds Kubernetes and all these other projects, there's the TAG security, the Security Technical Advisory Group of which I'm a member. And we've released a couple versions of white papers that talk about how to secure your cloud native environments. This is effectively best practices from the CNCF about using cloud native tools. And here in that white paper, we talk about how to secure and how developers run their applications. And this is the development stage. There's a few different stages that an application goes through to go from a developer's in a developer's head to running in production. This is the develop step. And you can see that containers are as far left as development. You've got the developer IDE right here. And very commonly, you're going to see Docker files, or sometimes they're called container files. And you've got other pre-commit hooks, if you're familiar with those, ways to secure what developers are working on that also reference Docker files. So the idea here is that as far left as development, we've got containers. Moving a little bit further along in the development process, you want to distribute the thing that you worked on, right? The developer made some code, put it in a container. They need to get it eventually to running, but they're not there yet. They're trying to distribute it. And here you see many more areas where containers matter. And it's pretty much across the board, build the container registry. There's a stage literally just for storing all of these files, security testing, integrity, and then getting it out into the runtime by deploying it. So you develop, distribute, you eventually deploy it, and you're using containers throughout. And then finally, your thing is deployed and it's running. And this whole workload orchestration section is where these containers are running. You see ways to restrict the access, the runtime of containers, but the core fundamental thing is that they are containers. They are processes that have been constrained in some way. So if you're able to secure containers from 
their entire throughout their entire life cycle, then you can go through your entire software development life cycle with some additional security. Now, it's not the only thing you need to be thinking about and doing, but it is a very critical thing. So let's cover security. So we, we've covered why containers, where containers, what are containers, what's the value? And when we think about security, it's very easy to start with the triad, right? The confidentiality, integrity, availability triad. And this is a very convenient standard way that we as security practitioners think about the security of our environment, but it's not the only way. And there's also an uh, increasingly popular separate way to think about this. And that is the DIE. So whereas historically we think about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and those are still important in modern environments, we can shift our approach and our thinking a little bit in that if we develop a system an environment that is D, I, and E, distributed, ephemeral, and immutable, then we might get a lot of CIA attributes by doing that. And so you can take a DIE first approach to security, and that includes using containers and securing those containers. <clears throat> and that will improve the security of your environment, accomplish a lot of your CIA requirements, and then you can fill a couple additional gaps based on your company's security requirements, policies, compliance uh, needs, et cetera. So I just wanna do a very brief introduction to DIE and then we'll, we'll wrap up and transition to the, to the workshop. Now these words, you probably are familiar with them at a high level, but I wanna say like, what specifically am I talking about so we'll go through each one, starting with distributed. So here I've affectionately borrowed a diagram from the Kubernetes project where they show what a Kubernetes cluster is. And this is just one of many examples of distributing your work. You have all of these different applications, whether it's monolith, one big application or a microservice based application with lots of little things, if you're using containers, you put something in a container, you deploy that, it needs to run. And if you get a lot of interest in your application, a lot of users, a, lot, a high amount of CPU usage, you're going to need to expand. You need to have a cluster that can scale out and scale in based on demand. And that's what a distributed approach gives you. You can run these nodes. They're just servers. And those servers run containers and they've got this whole orchestration control plane level, which says that server's a little uh, getting out of memory. We need more memory. Let's get another server. It provisions another server. It runs the systems that are, are the containers that are running out of memory, out of resources, they'll move them over or reprovision them or just provisional addi provision additional ones. It handles that. But the idea here is that we are distributing things. And because containers are very portable, you are able to run it on multiple different nodes, multiple different servers in very self-contained ways. This is very valuable for making sure that we have reasonable response times, we're meeting our SLAs for our clients, et cetera. So this is kind of like the first of those three tenants. Second, we'll look at ephemeral. So ephemeral just means it's up and available when we need it, and then it goes away. So Google Cloud Log did a great job, I think, at succinctly demonstrating this. We have someone asking for us to do work. They are going into a UI using some piece of software. That software is running in a container. So they make a request and now the system, this cloud-based server-based system knows that we have some work to do. And so it's gonna start a container. It responds, it does whatever the workload is, then it's done. 
maybe there was a peak of users and then it's dropping off, less people interested in using the application now, the containers go idle and then they will shut down and stop. Those can then get terminated, cleaned up, deleted, and we're not spending time or money running large elaborate systems that nobody's using. You can just start these containers as there's demand, as there's an event that requires them, run them to serve the requests and then shut them down, terminate them, et cetera. And you can deploy this ephemeral approach across a very broad environment. I do this on my local laptop. If I need to run a little job, I'll run a container. It'll do its work and it'll shut down. It'll tell me what it did. You can run this in your deployment steps. When a developer is looking to see if they are, they're following the standard, your company standard, they will go through CI, continuous integration. You run some policy checks or integration tests, et cetera. That can all be run on top of ephemeral infrastructure. Same with deploying it and same with running it. So your entire life cycle can be ephemeral. And then finally, immutable, right? So DIE, wrapping up with immutable. This means that you don't make changes to the environment, you refresh the environment. So we've got time passing, we, we have some need to update an application. Historically, if you were using mutable infrastructure, you would push a new version of the application out. You go from app v1 to v1.1, you might, you, you add that to some running server, you reboot it, you refresh it, you do some change to it. You're actually mutating that server, that runtime, whatever it is. And immutability says, no, we're not actually going to make a change to anything. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make a new thing, which is app version 1.1, deploy app version 1.1, point people to that, and then we can terminate the old one, very similar to ephemeral systems. But what we're saying is we're not actually going to make changes to anything. We're going to replace it. And what's great about immutability is it has really good rollback characteristics. If you've ever patched systems for a living, I definitely have. You know that those don't always go well. And you might need to revert a patch, and that might not always go well. And so now you're in this situation where you tried to do something, you tried to undo it, and it didn't undo completely, and you might still have an issue. That's not great. But with immutable infrastructure, you are literally just swapping components out. And so you, when you swap it back, you need to undo the change. You know it's actually going to be exactly the same because it's immutable. It has not changed. It cannot change. There's high integrity on these components of your environment. And so if you were to map CIEA, and DIE, you can see that these distributed systems are very re resilient, which accomplishes a lot of our high availability needs. The ephemeral workloads are extremely fast moving. And so your components are only around for short periods of time, which doesn't eliminate confidentiality needs, but it does make it a lot more difficult to abuse because if you do exploit something, the time that you have to abuse it is very low because that th that system's actually gonna go away. You lose this ability for persistence and things like that. And then immutability, if you have an immutable environment, it can't be changed, which by definition is integrity, right? And there are not just systems and components that run immutably, but there's also, um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. But there's uh, all of these different components that can run immutably. Oh, databases, that's what I was gonna say. There are databases which can be append only and you have this immutable core where you can't actually change history. You only add things on. And they have these really interesting attributes where if you wanna delete something, you don't actually delete it. You say, I'm gonna add a tombstone record that says I no longer want you to consider that thing here, but it is still here, it's, it's immutable. There's some pros and cons of that approach. But... All right, last slide, and we're gonna to get to the workshop. Even if you deploy an environment that has strong CIA, DIE, you're using containers, following all of the CNCF tag security best practices, all the stuff I talked about, there's still attacks that you need to worry about. This is a layered approach, nothing changes there. So you wanna think about supply chain security. So what's in your X? 
And there are tools like that uh, to help with identifying that software bill of materials, which we will hit in the lab. You wanna know maybe how something was created. That's a modern technique called provenance. Who created it? You can do cryptographic signatures. These are all problems that we still need to contend with. And there's also policy as code. So policy as code says, you might have a requirement to run things as best, at least privilege. You might say it's a best practice and you can enforce that with tools, this suite of tools called policy as code. Same thing with vulnerability management. You might need things, uh, applications that can be exploited to be remediated quickly. Some sort of mitigation, some sort of risk reduction. Maybe it's patching where if you take that immutable approach, you deploy a new thing, get rid of the old thing. But that's how you manage your vulnerabilities, different runtime protections, et cetera. And so many of these more modern attacks, and this is, you know, dot, dot, dot at the bottom. There's many more of them. But a lot of these attacks, this, these example of attacks are things that we're going to be looking at and preventing in the upcoming workshop. So we're gonna jump over to that workshop now. This is made to run on Ubuntu 2004 AMD x86 based system, AMD 64. If you have maybe 2204, some other things, I have done some initial testing, it seems to work, but I would highly recommend actually making sure that you're doing an Ubuntu 2004. And at the top of the workshop, we've got a couple options to help make that easier. So to get to the workshop, you can just go to johnziola.com slash workshop.html. And that'll, that's just like a shortcut to redirect you to the right place. It's a slightly longer URL. And also don't forget to join the Slack workspace. So we will not be using the Zoom chat. We will be using that Slack workspace for questions. So check out the hashtag help channel if you need help. Uh, myself, uh, Ben Allen, uh, Laura, we'll all be on there. So, but feel free to throw those in the help and we can assist. And then others who might also be seeing the same issue can see the resolution or the problem. Uh, okay, so just one more quick thing. I just wanna give an idea of what this looks like. So if you go to that URL, you should get redirected to something that looks like this, container security one-on-one -on -one with lots of words in it. This very important getting started section is where you can click CloudFormation template if you wanna provision an Ubuntu 2004 system that meets our requirements in AWS. You're gonna need your own AWS environment. You need to be logged in, et cetera. If you do that and provision it, you'll see something like this, where you have a workshop, the create should be complete at the end. So after it runs for a little bit of provision, you know, a few different resources. And then in the outputs tab, you'll see the IP address. So this is the IP you need to SSH into. Here's an example SSH command. So if you're in the same directory as whatever key that you use, that's the name of mine, then you should be able to copy and paste this and run it. But this will give you the information you need once provisioning is done to get into your system and actually start the workshop. And you'll have to then run these commands. So you, even if you do the CloudFormation template, you still have to run this code block, this code block, follow these steps, and then you'll be ready to get started. We'll go through, through terminology and a bunch of other really fun things. And yeah, if you find any issues or have any feedback on the lab, let me know, throw it in the help channel. And I'll be, I'll be kind of floating around in uh, cyberspace, <laughs> in the Slack workspace, and let me know if you have issues. And then we'll, we'll regroup about 10 till. So in Eastern, that's 1150. We'll just do a quick wrap up uh, and, and close things out. Also, just one quick note. This will be recorded. So if you need to be distracted or uh, take a break for any reason and you don't feel like you can get through it in time, that's totally fine. Also, don't feel the pressure to just copy and paste commands and throw them in your terminal to get the thing done. You know, there's a lot of content in here that's outside of the code blocks. And if I just scroll down here, you can also see that some of the code blocks or the additional information is collapsed. So if you click on some of these blocks, you'll see more information. That's all accessory, context information, 
links to interesting other blogs or or things like that. So just don't forget to pop those open, read them, take your time. This will be hosted essentially indefinitely here. I will be maintaining this over the next few months as I make changes to it, but no worries. Uh, if you're not able to get to everything during this exact time block, we've got plenty of time. So, all right, uh, that's all I've got for now. Go ahead and enjoy working through the workshop. Again, take your time, read, think about it all, ask some questions. I'll be here, Ben and myself will be here to answer questions and help out and best of luck. We're about 10 minutes from the end. So we'll just do a little wrap up here. Thanks everyone for all the great feedback and questions. If you have more feedback that you want to give, don't forget Laura posted the uh, survey, that very short form. So check that out. And if you have other feedback that you would like to give me directly, a lot of great ways to do that. You can email me. My email will be at the end. Connect on LinkedIn, send me a message things like that. There was a ton of questions and comments and feedback. I think I've addressed everybody, but if I missed you, feel free to send me another at or a direct message or anything like that. Thank you, Laura, for that. Let's pin it real quick temporarily. But yeah, send me, send me a message. If you have any feedback, throw us a survey. Uh, let me know again if I missed your question happy to happy to assist there. So that's let's wrap this up. So <clears throat> if you liked this content, this is just a bit of a small part of what we do in SANS cloud security. So our goal is to help you along your entire cloud security journey. Here we've got a progression chart. So if you want more content, you can see the class that I teach 540 right here is an option, but there's numerous others, right? Depending on if you thought this uh, was too technical, we've got some you know, more baseline and, and foundational classes. If you want more of this or similar materials, I know there's a few people talking in the channel about you know, incident response or architecture and things like that. We've got classes for a lot of those. So feel free to check those out here. And then also notice this flight plan. I love the flight plan because it gives these different career projections progressions. And so if you're really into being a cloud security architect, we'll point you to the couple that we think are more uh, going to be more valuable to you. And then also we've got these newer cloud ace journeys. So a pretty similar concept. If you would like to be a cloud security engineer, consider 540, 510, 549. And we've got a few other, other ones in there. Also, if you want to do more of these sorts of workshops, we've got a few of them coming up. So here are three of them, one in May, two in June, that are cloud security workshops, and uh, especially this last one, Docker Crash Course. So if we used Docker commands or tools that you weren't familiar with or felt like weren't covered enough for you, that's going to be a really good one where the kind of Docker run commands, Docker network, et cetera, that I breezed over and provided links to self-guided learning. Uh, that will be a little bit more focused on teaching and, and getting hands-on with those and understanding how they work, how they don't work, et cetera. So feel free to check any of those out. Sands.org slash workshops is a great way uh, to, to keep those in mind. I also, just one more time, I would love to get feedback, especially if you want a different sort of workshop uh, or accessory content. I've got lots of ideas. I'm a huge fan of paved road. We talked about this in the chat or policy as code, other sort of container orchestration, runtime, build time controls, just focused on those smaller areas. There's lots of different things we could cover, but it, uh, you know, making a choice will be easier if you all let me know what you're interested in. So please send me a message or somehow get out, uh, reach out to me. 
So here is my contact information. That QR code, I promise, is not malicious. You can trust me, right? Uh, that goes to my LinkedIn, but you can just go to linkedin.com slash in slash John Ziola. Send me an email to any of those emails. And uh, yeah, feedback is welcome. I hope you enjoyed our workshop today. If anyone has any additional questions, throw those in the workshop. I'll stick around for a little while after and just continue to answer questions if you've got them. Also, there was a few repeating questions. Is there going to be a recording? Yes. That'll be shared out in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for that. We will also be sharing these slides. So if you'd like to look at the slides, click the links, anything like that, that will all be available. Uh, and yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. Thanks everyone for your uh, positive feedback. Great. Uh, policy is code workshop. Yeah, that sounds that sounds really exciting. I that's personally probably my favorite. That's most of the work that I do in the CNCF and OpenSSF is has to do with policy as code, especially if you've got these word documents that say you must do X and Y and Z. You want code that makes sure you're doing X and Y and Z, or at least you know when you're not, as opposed to telling people to and hoping they follow. <laughs> right? Uh, definitely a telemetry first approach. So, all right. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the the workshop, and don't forget check out the future workshops. And you know, I you, I would not be surprised if you saw my name again on there not too long in the future. Take care, everybody. Thanks.